Good morning. Good to see you. Beautiful day today. I don't know about you. It's been hot in Boise. Has it been hot out here? It's been so hot in Boise. It's been so hot in Boise. How hot was it? The cows, the cows are giving evaporated milk. Ah, okay. All right. So... You want one? You want one? It's been so hot in Boise. The chickens are laying hard-boiled eggs. Okay. All right. That's all I got. That's all right. Okay. So we're going to begin our worship today with the ringing of our church bell. Good morning. Um, the congregational announcements, um, they're in the back as, as we, usual. And next Sunday is the welcome of Andy Henley and Edward Thackchave. Um, and they're playing special music, so, and there's a barbecue afterwards. So um, if you haven't read that in the bulletin, please do so in case you're coming next Sunday. Um, so there are other things back there if you make sure you want to read. So, the call to worship. It is a good thing to praise the Lord and to sing praises to his name. Show forth his loving kindness in the morning and his faithfulness at night. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song and bless his name forever. For all we know that in all things God is at work for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Please join me in the invocation. We come before you, Lord, reminded of the persistent call to give you thanks and praise. We know that your words tell us, in everything give thanks. It's easy, Father, to thank you for the good gifts of this life. But in our worship today, we come to knowing that we're to thank you in the rough and difficult times and trust you even in the fullness of trial. May our worship focus our hearts and minds to recall the truth that you are constantly at work for our good and your glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Hymn number 353, verses 1, 5, and 6.
And please, you pass the piece, sign the register, so wave your hands, give them a handshake. We're going to invite the children forward now. she is. Oh. How are you all doing today? Good. Am I on? Am I on? Okay. All right. So, you know, sometimes, have you ever been, have asked your folks for something for maybe for Christmas or your birthday and you tell them what you want and you tell them and you tell them and then it's not there? You search all the, the presents under the tree, and it's just not there. Has that ever happened, Lola? Does that happen to you? It has. Can you tell me what it was you wanted? Um, it's a Lego set. Oh, a Lego set, sure. Oh, yeah, those are big. How about you, Daniel? Phone. Phone? Oh, he wants a phone already. Yeah. Your sister got, did you get a phone? No, no. Autumn. Oh, Autumn, of course. She's older, isn't she? Okay, so what about you? Have you ever wanted something? So... Last Christmas, I asked five times, can I, at least, I asked them for just a single Lego set. But they said no. Like, it's just a Lego set. You can buy it on Amazon. It's way cheaper because on the store at Walmart, the tiny Lego sets, that they're tiny and they cost $15. They're expensive, those Lego sets, aren't they? Did you ever get it later, maybe? Nope. Never got it. Nope. You got what? A PS5 instead. Well, I guess that's uh, not that too bad, is it? How about you? How about you, Lincoln? Did you ever ask for something and you just didn't get it? Yes. What was it? It was a flying robot. A flying robot, not just a regular one, huh? And you never got it. Oh. How about you, Landon? It was a flying robot. Oh, you wanted one too, huh? hard to build one. Yeah, so he needed help. You all, you both needed help, didn't you? Well, when I was a little girl, when I was five, I, I asked my folks over and over and over, I wanted a grandma doll, which was unusual for me because I never played with dolls, right? But I wanted a grandma doll, and I searched the packages under the tree, and it just wasn't there, right? And, um, but I waited, and on my birthday, which was a few months later, guess what I got? So sometimes, sometimes when you ask for something and you don't get it, and sometimes you just have to be patient, but sometimes, you know, when you're in a difficult situation maybe, or you ask for something and you begin pray for it, you maybe pray to Jesus or God, please, I need this, I want my Lego set, I want my, my uh, flying robot, I want my Lego set, so, or, or your robot. Yeah. You ever build your robot? I'm building it, but I'm not that good at building. Yeah, it takes a while, doesn't it? So sometimes you have to be patient, and guess what? Sometimes, sometimes you just have to be patient. Sometimes you have to have faith, because sometimes Jesus or God 
knows maybe what you want isn't really what you need, right? So sometimes he, he brings you what you need, but maybe not what you want, right? So the pastor today is going to talk about three men who were in a really bad situation, and they prayed and prayed and prayed, and because they really needed his help, he gave it to them, right? So sometimes you have to have patience, and you have to have faith, right? Okay. All right. So let's bow our heads. Jesus, thank you for these wonderful children. And I hope that they get their flying robot and their, and their Lego sets. And what else was it? A phone. A phone. Yes. Well, that'll come in time, I'm sure. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we want to continue to remember the Hendersons and the Townsends, Grace, and the boys, their families, in our prayers as well through this time. Let's go to God then in prayer. Father God, we, we come before you this morning with any number of thoughts and feelings. Some of us here are, come with great deep deep joy. Life is good and we're grateful. Some, some of us have come with questions or with doubts that confuse us. Some are here today with ongoing grief at recent loss of loved ones. And so we come with our sorrows. We come with our joys, our disappointments, our difficulties. Lord, we don't want to cling to cheap sources of consolation that too soon pass away, but instead through our, our worship point us to the deeper and richer resources of faith. And so our prayer this morning is that you would come and abide with us, shine the light of your love and your truth upon us, drive away any darkness, help us to live wisely. There are times when we may not know what to do. And so help us to keep our eyes on you, realizing that nothing can get between us and your love. And that gives us a solid and steady place to stand. And for all of that, then, we're grateful. Even as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 96, verses 8 and 9 says this, Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Those little verses tell us that an empty-handed worship is as impossible as an empty-hearted worship. We're called to bring our offerings as well as our praise. And so we now give our tithes and our offerings to the Lord.
Lord, you're greatly to be praised, and we worship you this morning with our words and our prayers, our songs, and our giving of money. And it's all an offering of praise today, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Our scripture lesson is from Daniel 3, verses 1 through 25, the golden image. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, and the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the perfect prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods and do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall be immediately thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is it that the gods that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, 
Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that you, we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, True, O king. He replied, But I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has appeared as a god. The word of God for the people of God. Have you ever prayed and felt as though you've not received an answer? Or at least the answer that you wanted? The kids told us that <laughs> this morning. There are times, though, when life this side of heaven feels like a tremendous struggle, whether it's physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. Have you longed for some breakthrough from God, and yet it's as though there's almost like a, a kind of ceiling over your life, and prayers just don't penetrate? Maybe it's, it's been guidance over some decision or a difference in your marriage or worry over a child or grandchild or some other loved one. Maybe it's just the unrest in the world these days, some anxiety, a sorrow. But somewhere where the heat is on, where the hot blast of some difficulty just threatens to parch your soul. Well, we're moving through this, this series of messages, did Jesus ever say, and has it ever seemed to you as though he said, sorry, you'll have to face this one on your own. Sorry, you'll have to face this one, this difficulty, heartache, this pain, this struggle, this decision, this situation. You're going to have to deal with that just yourself. Well, the scripture that we've just heard here this morning from Daniel gives us an amazing, a, a strengthening word for the times when we're facing some trial, dealing with some difficulty, when it seems as though we just might be on our own. Now, along with Daniel, these three heroes of our story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the thousands of residents of Jerusalem are taken captive in 605 BC when King Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem. Off in Babylon, now, the finest of the young men were being trained for the king's service. And Daniel and these three courageous young men were among them. Now, Daniel, at this point, he's not mentioned in this particular story, and it's just assumed that he's in another part of the kingdom on some assigned official business. But all of this is at the height of Nebuchadnezzar's power. It's around 586 BC. Now in the prior chapter, chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed a strange dream about a, a statue with a, a head of gold and chest and arms of silver, the middle portion of bronze, then legs of iron and feet mixed with iron and clay. And 
he was puzzled by that dream. Daniel had interpreted it, and Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was indeed represented by that head of gold. But the dream meant that other kingdoms and other great empires would follow his, and that is not how the king wanted to see it. So, then feeling the, the pride of his claim to universal and abiding sovereignty over this greatly expanding empire of his, representing his, his will for the future, he built a gigantic 90-foot tall statue of himself, all of gold. And he demanded that everybody bow before it at the sound of the music. And we heard it was the lyre and the tim and the drums and the thing and the hall and that and that. And so you get the idea that this was important. The reason that those are listed every time, you say, well, it, they go through that every time. It's, it, what, what the writer of Daniel is letting us know is this was important. That's the whole point there. And the decree was bow or burn. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not. Now here again, verses, verses 17 and 18. If we're thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us. He will deliver us out of your hand, your majesty. But if he doesn't, understand, sir, that even then we will never under any circumstances serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have erected. Even if he doesn't. Now, here's three men in that great crowd who stood tall when everybody else bowed down. They stood strong in faith, not shamed or mocked into bowing. So here's the truth of it. Biblical, biblical faith has the assurance to say, we know that our God is able. It has the confidence to say, we believe that our God will. But it all also has the submission to say, but even if he doesn't deliver us in the way that we would like, we will still trust him. They're saying it might be intervention. It might be incineration. We don't know. But together they trusted in the promises of God and together they trusted in the providence of God. And they had the assurance of God's power. They had confidence in God's love. And they had submission to God's sovereignty. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't overcome by threats. They weren't impressed by all the crowds. They weren't swayed by superstitious ceremony. They obeyed the Lord. They trusted him to work out the consequences. So, here it is for us. Here are the four words for trial. We all experience the trials, the difficulties, the hard times of this life, this side of heaven. Four words. Four words for trial. But if he doesn't. But if he doesn't. There's a kind of faith, a kind of faith that says, well, my. I'll obey God. I'll obey God as long as things work out the way I want them to go. And there's a kind of faith that bargains, makes promises to God to persuade him to answer prayer in a particular way. But what about this kind of faith? This kind of faith. The faith of these three young Hebrew men here in Daniel. But if he doesn't, I just suppose there's no real surrender or true release from any burden until we know the freedom of praying that kind of prayer. Because we all confront the furnace of trial. So to all of us who face what seems to be unanswered prayer or are in the midst of difficulties that is yet are resisting a solution or dealing with some ongoing disappointment that's just kind of racking your life right now when it seems as though the temperature of the furnace just keeps increasing and the thermostat is broken dare to pray but if he doesn't because the furnace of trial is where our obedience meets the reality of the world it's where our 
obedience meets the realities of the world. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in trouble because they wouldn't bow down to this false image of the king. But they'd made a decision to live faithfully. They had made a decision to stand steady long before that day. Long before that day. They'd made those faith-affirming, confidence-building decisions in the days, the weeks, the months prior to all of that. Now chapter 1 of Daniel tells us that along with Daniel, these three young men were tempted with all kinds of delicacies of secular, worldly Babylon. Rich food, uh, comfort, power. Chapter 1 tells us all about that. And even their Hebrew names, and you didn't have to read these, here they are, even their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Okay, those were their true Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Even those names were changed, containing then references, references to the false gods of the culture that now surrounded them in Babylon, with the thought that they'd soon forget the Lord God. But they stood faithful. They stood firm in their faith. Their names might be changed, but no one could change their resolve. And so when the crisis confronted them, they were prepared for it, and they stood tall. Now, here's the truth of it. It's not just for them. It's for us. We do not prepare for the crisis in the midst of the crisis. We do not prepare for the crisis in the midst of the crisis. For example... We need to ask ourselves that if, if it comes, how will we handle the onset of persecution? How will we deal with tough decisions? If it were to come, how will we face a culture of increased aggressive secular hostility? What if the next years bring not just a bored apathy toward the gospel, but in an increased antagonism. Well, we have made the decision to stand steady. Again, here it is. We do not prepare for the crisis in the midst of the crisis. But even these days, even these days, there's a lot of false gods erected around us calling for our worship. Any number of golden images. Materialism, power, personality, drugs and booze and false gods of cultural pressure, race and politics and stocks and stuff and schedules. And we can be tempted to bow because the idols just look fabulous or fashionable or the culture around us says, oh, come on, come on, be flexible. You need to change some attitudes here. Loosen up. Or we're just afraid that we'll lose or forfeit something if we don't. But there's something beyond our struggle with obedience and our attempt to stay faithful, our, our fight to stay steady, that can be even more daunting. And it happens when someone we know or somebody we love or have trusted just attempts to pull us down. And we begin to hear things like, well, well, you, you can pray, but God doesn't really intervene. Or, you know, I guess, I guess some people are just meant to suffer. Or, hmm, there must be something wrong with you. And in some form, there's just that kind of subtle suggestion that the trial or the difficulty or the seeming unanswered prayer has to do not with the decision and ability of God, but with our adequacy or our lack of it. And so folks say, well, you prayed about that? You prayed about that and didn't get the answer you wanted? Huh. You poor thing. There must be something lacking in your faith. You've likely noticed we're living in a, a period of time 
in this country where we've fallen into a kind of subjective, sloppy kind of thinking that says everything really ought to be smooth and easy. If I can just conjure, conjure up enough good feelings to belief, then all my problems, my affliction, all my trouble is going to be untangled. And there's whole systems of belief, all kinds of churches that just kind of preach that kind of uh, gospel, gospel, and kind of uh, name it and claim it kind of thing. If I can just get the words right, and get the right formula, and say the prayer right, or recite enough verses, or do enough, then all my problems, my affliction, my trouble is just going to be untangled. And along with this kind of thinking, God is somehow compelled to determine things to my advantage, especially if I live a good life according to my own chosen criteria. And so God just becomes a means to my own ends. Kind of a cosmic bellhop that I call on when I need him. And there's a kind of mushy pseudo-religion these days that researchers are calling moralistic therapeutic deism. Kind of big, long, two-dollar words. Moralistic therapeutic deism. And one of its basic tenets is that the central goal of life <clears throat> is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. And one author says it this way. <coughs> it's mostly about improving one's self-esteem and subjective happiness and getting along well with others. But it has little to do with the Christianity of Scripture that teaches repentance, self-sacrificial love, purity of heart, and commends suffering the way of the cross as the pathway to God. The truth, the truth is we're not free from the consequences of, of living in this fallen world. And, and God does not always give an easy answer. We've all known people, people who've prayed their prayers, worshipped faithfully, who've asked God repeatedly to intercede in some way. But they've learned that there's another, another kind of intercession that God makes. And it isn't always in the shape of the answer they wanted. And sometimes, sometimes it comes just in the courage to stand in the midst of the flames of the pressure or the trial of patience or the, the courage to continue to love an ability to trust even when there does not seem to be any change. See, this is called confidence in the furnace of trial. And then we, re we leave the results to God. Because solid biblical faith is not, is not confidence in what we think must be some particular outcome. Solid biblical faith is not confidence in what we think must be some particular outcome. It's confidence in a sovereign God. It's not trust in our belief. It's trust in our God. And that's what it means to say, even if he doesn't. It's a magnificent kind of freedom, even when the furnace confronts us somehow. Because there are aspects of this life that you and I just cannot control. And there are times when it is absolutely, truly difficult. Listen to what Peter says. It's in 1 Peter chapter 4. He writes this, Friends, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Now this is from the translation called The Message. Don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you're in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. The kind of perspective makes a difference, is what Peter is saying. That's how it is with a spiritual refining process. Because some lessons only come through tears. 
And there are times when it seems like the temperature in the furnace has gone so high it can't get any hotter. But Peter says here, don't jump to the conclusion that God has bailed on you, that he's not with you, that he's not at work. Instead, Peter says, rejoice that you're in the very thick of what Jesus Christ experienced himself. He's saying, don't be upset. Don't be surprised when you're challenged somehow in your faith or even for your faith. Because the dross, that spiritual refining process, the dross, the impurities they, in our life, they come to the surface. And then we give those to the Lord and we give him the opportunity to remove them and refine us. Elizabeth Elliot wrote this, Out of the hottest fires have come the deepest things I know about God. So we either believe God knows what he's doing or we believe he doesn't. We either believe he's trustworthy or we believe he's not. So, attitudes that hinder or values that demand false loyalty, habits that bind us, plans for the, the future that have never been surrendered to the Lord or some jealousy that's been souring us or some hatred that's poisoning, some memory that just tends to suffocate our spirit, Bitterness, some situation, something that reveals our pride, self-centeredness. It's things like these and so many more about us that need that refining process and removal. But when we're living through the hard times, the furnaces, we just may not know what to do. Which decision is better or which, which direction among all the options? And there's a little verse in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. And it is such an amazing little verse. It just says, We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Wow, that's a good prayer. Lord, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to keep my eyes on you. It's 2 Chronicles 20, 12. A great little verse. So we ask for his guidance. We ask his direction, we ask his help, and we fix our gaze on God, not the circumstances that are swirling around us. Just because my plans get changed or my problem isn't solved just when I want it, in my own way, or the answer's delayed, it doesn't mean that God is not at work. He's always letting us know, and he's always calling us to leave the results to him. Because continuing steady through the furnace of trial Always, we can always be sure of the Lord's presence. He's the Lord who said, I am with you always. Listen to Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verses 8 and 9. I'm always aware of the Lord's presence. He's near and nothing can shake me. I am so thankful and glad and I feel completely secure. So, the question did Jesus ever say, you'll have to face this one on your own? <laughs> no. Absolutely not. No. Because when Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar looked into that furnace, remember what was read? To his surprise, he saw not, not three, not three young men dying, but four walking around in the midst of that blazing inferno, completely unharmed, as though they were in a palace, not a furnace. Now Daniel 3.25 says that the fourth person looked like a son of the gods, a son of the gods. And Nebuchadnezzar wasn't far off. Because what we see here in this little verse, here in Daniel chapter 3, Old Testament, what we see here is what's called a theophany. A theophany. It's an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament in a pre-incarnate form. A theophany. From ancient times, Jesus is saying, I am with you always. That's why in the Gospel of John, he's asked, He's asked how old he is, and his response at one point is, before Abraham was, 
I am. Do you remember that? Remember that reply in John's gospel? Before Abraham, I was born, I am. I existed, he's saying, before even Abraham. It's amazing. And so what we see here, again, it's called a theophany. I am with you always, Jesus is saying. So, bring it home to us. When you face problems, when you run out of strength, when your heart aches, whether it's grief or business reversals or tough circumstances or a, a pension that just shrinks every month, some sickness, chronic pain that lingers, children, grandchildren that rebel, a partner that betrays, some lack of forgiveness, a, a decision that will determine how or whether you move ahead, a death. When the furnace heats up, it can harden us, it can make us bitter, or in faith, in faith, it can bring us to a fresh view of our Lord and a deeper awareness of his presence, living, walking, but always, always abiding right here with you. Remember his promises. I will never leave you or forsake you. And here's how Paul writes it. Romans chapter 8. I'm absolutely convinced. Nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. He holds you tightly. And nothing, nothing can come between him and you. We're going to stand together and sing our, our uh, closing, closing hymn. Trust and obey. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Let's stand.
next Sunday, next Sunday, 